Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of The Emerald City of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So I read this as a buddy read with uh, Joel Swagman. We're slowly reading our way through the whole series. I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb. Uh, we've got a longy one here. There's also a, an author bio, which I think is quite cool. Then we're going to jump in and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the blurb. Dane reads... Faced with the prospect of their family farm being repossessed, Dorothy transports Uncle Henry and Aunt Em to Oz, hoping that there they will be able to begin a new life, unthreatened. Unbeknownst to them, and to Princess Ozma, the Gnome King, squatting in his underground kingdom, is planning a devastating attack on Oz. While General Guff sets off on a dangerous mission to recruit allies for the Gnome King's diabolical army, Dorothy and her companions embark on a tour of the Magical Kingdom, eager to discover more about its fascinating people and countries. Will Dorothy and Ozma uncover the Gnome King's evil plot and foil his attack, or will he catch them unawares and manage to destroy the beautiful Emerald City? Nearly a hundred years after the books were first written, the vast, peculiar world of Oz continues to fascinate children and adults alike. Full of weird and wonderful characters, the incomparable L. Frank Baum's stories are still as magical as ever. Hesperus's brand new series of Oz books features three other titles, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, The Marvelous Land of Oz, and Glinda of Oz. So that pretty cool author bio I mentioned. Lyman Frank Baum, 1856-1919, was an American author of children's books, best known for writing The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. He wrote 13 novel sequels, 9 other fantasy novels, and a host of short stories. He tried his hand at many different careers. He was a theatre actor and director, a chicken breeder, a newspaper editor, a shop owner, and at one stage, he designed window displays for department stores using clockwork and animation. So, I want to start with the author's note here, because the author's notes are always very cute. So this is written in Coronado 1910, and Baum said, Perhaps I should admit on the title page that this book is by L. Frank Baum and his correspondence, for I have used many suggestions conveyed to me in letters from children. Once on a time I really imagined myself an author of fairy tales, but now I am merely an editor or private secretary for a host of youngsters whose ideas I am requested to weave into the thread of my stories. These ideas are often clever. They are also logical and interesting. So I've used them whenever I could find an opportunity, and, it's but, and it is but just that I acknowledge my indebtedness to my little friends. My, what imaginations these children have developed. Sometimes I am fairly astounded by their daring and genius. There will be no lack of fairy tale authors in the future, I am sure. My readers have told me what to do with Dorothy and Aunt Emma and Uncle Henry, and I have obeyed their mandates. They have also given me a variety of subjects to write about in the future, enough, in fact, to keep me busy for some time. I am very proud of this alliance. Children love these stories because children have helped to create them. My readers know what they want and realise that I try to please them. The result is very satisfactory to the publishers, to me, and, I am quite sure, to the children. I hope, my dears, it will be a long time before we are obliged to dissolve partnership. So I just thought that was very sweet. So, getting in towards the start here, we get this great line, an unsuspected enemy is doubly dangerous. And it's kind of interesting because it literally starts on the antagonists rather than on uh, Dorothy. And we get this uh, interesting little description of the Emerald City which includes a description of uh, its population which I just thought was cool. The Emerald City is built all of beautiful marbles in which are set a profusion of emeralds, every one exquisitely cut and of very great size. There are other jewels used in the decorations inside the houses and palaces, such as rubies, diamonds, sapphires, amethysts and turquoises. But in the streets and upon the outside of the buildings, only emeralds appear, from which circumstance the place is named the Emerald City of Oz. It has 9,654 buildings, in which live 570,318 people, up to the time my story opens. Uh, and a little bit of calculation there will tell you that that means 57 people live in every building. I suppose a lot of people live in the palace, to be fair, but still, that's a high average. So we get another great line here. It goes, uh, people often do a good deed without hope of reward, but for an evil deed, they always demand payment. And uh, we see Belina, and she's living very happily because Oz is vegan, I guess. Well, it's vegetarian. It says, Ozma doesn't know what to do with all the eggs we lay, and we are never eaten or harmed in any way, as chickens are in your country. And so, Aunt Emma and Uncle Henry, they meet uh, the cowardly lion, and they're scared of him. And so, um, Aunt Emma is like, I won't die, I won't be eaten by a lion. Then a thought struck her, and she whispered, Henry, I've heard of savage beasts can be conquered by the human eye. I'll set that lion out of countenance and save our lives. Try it, Em, he returned, also in a whisper. Look at him as you do at me when I'm late to dinner. 
hilarious. And Aunt M says every day is like Sunday now and I can't say I like it. And it just made me think of Morrissey because Morrissey has a song called Every Day Is Like Sunday. In fact, after I read that line earlier today, I ended up playing that on guitar to get it out of my head, you know? And there's the love magnet. It's hanging over the Emerald City. Still makes me laugh every time I see the, the name, the word love magnet. And, um... The, the 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 wizard has invented some school pills so um the professor hm wogglebug tm or whatever it is hm uh, he says these are the algebra pills one at night on retiring is equal to four hours of study here are the geography pills one at night and one in the morning in the next bottle are the latin pills one three times a day then we have the grammar pills one before every meal and the spelling pills which are taken whenever needed wouldn't that be a more efficient way of learning if only it was possible Okay, and then we get a place called Fuddlecum Jig. I guess it's pronounced Fuddlecum Jig, but I'm just like Fuddlecum Jig. Fuddlecum Jig. And so we get this conversation between Aunt M and Belina. Um, and <laughs> Belina says, I have an idea, I know more about chickens than human beings do. Sure replied Aunt Em. I've raised chickens for nearly 40 years, Belina, and I know you've got to starve them to make them lay lots of eggs and stuff them if you want good broilers. Broilers! exclaimed Belina in horror. Broil my chickens! Why, that's what they're for, ain't it? asked Aunt Em, astonished. No, Aunt, not in Oz, said Dorothy. People do not eat chickens here. You see, Belina was the first hen that was ever seen in this country, and I brought her here myself. Everybody liked her and respected her, so the Oz people wouldn't any more eat her chickens than they would eat Belina. Well, I declare, gasped Aunt Em, how about the eggs? Oh, if we have more eggs than we want to hatch, we allow people to eat them, said Belina. Indeed, I'm very glad that the Oz folks like our eggs, for otherwise they would spoil. So I like the healthy sort of vegetarian message here. Um, what um, vegan sanctuaries tend to do is actually you can fry eggs and then feed them back to the chickens. And it's like a really good source of vitamins, apparently. One day I might have backyard rescue chickens, we'll see. Let me get... Just this great line, Last sakes, ejaculated the good lady, holding up her hands in amazement. I always enjoy spotting ejaculations, you know this about me. And then a crab and a zebra are arguing about whether there's more water in the world than there is land. And uh, so we get, They know there's more water in the world than there is land, asserted the crab in a shrill, petulant voice. They know you are wrong to make such an absurd statement, and they will probably think you are a lobster instead of a crab, retorted the animal. But obviously there is more water than land. Even in Oz, apparently. Um, then the, the cleaver, who is the king of, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, Utens Utensia, I think it is. Uh, and the cleaver mutters something musingly, which I hate, because I hate adjectives used like that. Um, but we do get this great thing, they're going to have a trial. Um, and we get, Judge Sifter, stand on my right. It is your business to sift this affair to the bottom. High Priest Colander, stand on my left and see that no one testifies falsely in the matter. As these two officials took their places, Dorothy asked, Why is the colander the high priest? He's the holiest thing we have in the kingdom, replied King Cleaver. Great pun there. Um, and then a pepper box. He, said, he goes, I demand that they be killed several times until they are dead. Which is a very, like, Oz kind of thing to say, you know? So um, there are a few footnotes in this. There are actually a grand total of three footnotes. And this one here, Some of the lady rabbits carried lorgnettes, while many of the gentleman rabbits wore monocles in their left eyes. And then uh, the footnote for that says... A pair of glasses held in front of a person's eyes by a long handle on one, at one side. And I'm like, so you've defined um, monocles, but not lorgnettes. I know what a monocle is. I don't know what a lorgnette is. And then we get this as well. And this is very interesting. Bear in mind, I think this was published 1910. Um, Airships are not so bad after all, declared Dorothy. Someday they'll fly all over the world and perhaps bring people even to the land of Oz. I must speak to Ozma about that, said the wizard with a slight frown. It wouldn't do at all, you know, for the Emerald City to become a way station on an airship line. No, said Dorothy, I don't suppose it would. But what can we do to prevent it? I'm working out a magic recipe to fuddle men's brains so they'll never make an airship that will go where they want it to go, the wizard confided to her. That won't keep the things from flying now and then, but it will keep them from flying to the land of Oz. Um, and obviously that's very prescient because now we do have all these aeroplanes. I wonder what uh, Frank, Frank L. Baum would have made of it. Uh, the scarecrow is growing corn. He says, the corn I grow is always husky and I call the ears my regiments because they have so many kernels. Another great pun. And Nick Chopper, the Tim Woodman, he said, I do not aspire to being very wise for I have noticed that the happiest people are those who do not let their brains oppress them. Another great line there, a bit of philosophy. Um, and then at the end, basically, Oz gets closed off. And I want to read how the story of Oz came to an end. Because this is very clearly Frank L. Baum trying to draw a line under everything. 
and obviously he did write more Oz books. So he says, the writer of these Oz stories has received a little note from Princess Dorothy of Oz, which for a time has made him feel rather disconcerted. The note was written on a broad white feather from a stork's wing and it said, you will never hear anything more about Oz because we are now cut off forever from all the rest of the world. But Toto and I will always love you and all the other children who love us, Dorothy Gale. This seemed to me too bad at first, for Oz is a very interesting fairyland. Still, we have no right to feel grieved, for we have had enough of the history of the land of Oz to fill six storybooks, and from its quaint people and their strange adventures, we have been able to learn many useful and amusing things. So good luck to little Dorothy and her companions. May they live long in their invisible country and be very happy. So we're going to see how he kind of retcons that in the next book and keeps the series going. But overall, The Emerald City of Oz by L. Frank Baum. I love that Uncle Henry and Aunt, Hem and Aunt M were in this one um, because I find them quite interesting characters and it was just interesting to see adults in the land of Oz, you know? And also to have that, like, realism of them facing bankruptcy. Um, it's quite interesting to have that in a children's book, especially at this time, I think. I did save the last book. I felt as though the series had jumped the shark a bit, so I'm glad to say it's back on, like, firm footing now and looks as though Frank L. Baum... I don't know, has regained his mojo. I gave this a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5, did enjoy it, and I'm looking forward to reading the next one. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Emerald City of Oz by L. Frank Baum. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. Check out Joel's channel and his review of this, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.